Hey guys, so a bunch more news from Arena on the blog post front today. We had two of them specifically. One trying to clarify a little more about raids, while we're still really not clarified on too many details. We'll go over that. And also, another post detailing a further weekend of activity in-game that will be happening after this coming weekend. So, this next Friday we begin Beta Weekend Event 2, and then the Friday after that, starting on September 10th, we're going to be seeing some Mordrum invasions on a couple of maps. So I want to talk to you guys about that. There's actually a fair amount of detail to go into. So let's start specifically with the September 10th weekend. First of all, I think it's pretty cool that they've got two active weekends very quickly for all these new players on their new accounts. And specifically this blog post seems to be targeted to them. Don't forget these new people haven't necessarily spent much time in Dry Top or the Silver Wastes or doing any Season 2 content. And for them, the Mordrim, though maybe becoming a little old hat for us, are totally new and they'll get to experience some of that season one style big open world drop-ins. Think for us who have been doing things for a while, back to when the Scarlet Invasions will happen across multiple maps. That's exactly what I think we're getting here. And as the data mining suggested a while ago, these are going to be invasions occurring in Brisbane Wildlands, Kessex Hills, and Diesa Plateau. Now, what's significant about those three maps? They're all level 15 to 30 maps. They're all the second tier maps that we get. All three of them also are maps that don't have world bosses associated with them. Now, technically, I suppose you can say that Diesa Plateau has the mini dungeon and the font of Rand. If you guys haven't done that, it's the one where you go into a flame legion portal and do a really cool underwater mini dungeon where you have to carry a sword through the whole thing. One of the, my favorite mini dungeons in the entire game. I did a video on it in one of the betas and think back very fondly to that. And if you do kill this boss, you will get a world boss chest from it. It just doesn't appear on any of the big timers and people generally can't be asked to go down there. So they don't really have convincing world bosses and so I do want to read this post for you guys verbatim because it's it's literally four paragraphs. So again, a cool little image features three varieties of Mordrum. We got a husk, we got a pterogryph, and then we got a couple of trolls, I think those are. And, uh, and one very intimidated and outmatched looking engineer, I guess. And uh, so Mordrumoth is rallying its forces, sending armies of Mordrum out of the Maguma jungle to, to test Central Terrier's defenses, drive back the invasion, and stop the jungle dragon from sinking its teeth into vulnerable territory. So the battle begins from 9am on September 10th through till 9am on the 13th. Mordrum will be staging periodic incursions into Brisbane Wildlands, Kessex Hills, and Diesa Plateau. Keep an eye on the World Event UI. So this is the UI in the top right that will tell us, you know, if like a PvP tournament or something's going on. Even when we're not in those maps, basically, we'll know when those are happening. Which will let us know when Mordrumoth is launching its assault. Coordinate with other players to stop the Mordrum in their tracks, and you'll earn Mordrum Blooms. The Blooms are the research samples Dermot Priory is seeking. In exchange for the research samples, the Priory is offering concessions as a reward. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about already. Number one, these sound like this. It's not, even though it's going on for a weekend, that doesn't mean there's permanently Mordrum invasion happening in those maps for the whole weekend. It sounds like there's big waves of attacks that are going on. Why could ArenaNet be doing this? One, I think, yes, they do want to give those new players a bit of an experience of the living world. But two, maybe they're testing stuff. Maybe they're looking at their new AI that they've been working on. Maybe they're trying to see how it works at a large scale. One of the core issues that their AI overhaul has been looking to do is allow more entities to be on the battlefield and be more intelligent at that. So right now in Awe, for example, you will see there can be huge waves of mobs if events scale up high enough, but they tend to just do like auto attacks and they'll do it very slowly and they really don't get away with too much. It's only like a few enemies that they'll scale up to champion levels that can then do a variety of abilities and will often one-shot people. And I always look fondly back on that, like back with the fire elemental farm in Cursed Shore, where you scale up some champions so strong they do the, like the jesters would do ridiculous damage and blow everyone up. So that's what I think they're testing. I don't think it's a coincidence that the most recent patch actually addressed Necromancer minion reaction time. You know, that is the exact thing that their AI is trying to update. I think that the minions have moved over to this new system now where they are trying to be a little bit more responsive and I think really what arena net are trying to test is large-scale fights I think some of the later maps in heart of thorns may have complicated big high numbers of opponents that require high numbers of players too that maybe they don't have the ca capacity to fully test they can mathematically understand where things should be but to really see it in action maybe the best way to do uh, that testing is to drop it into the game in like a different form so that your player base, your active player base does it. And whatever they learn from this, they'll put into Heart of Thorns for those later maps. Those insanely huge siege maps or 2.0, whatever they have planned or envisioned for final uh, dragon map in Heart of Thorns. So that should be pretty interesting.
interesting. To keep reading the post, this event is recommended for players level 18 and up. If you're just starting your journey into Tyria, you can prepare by exploring the game world, completing maps, learning your character's abilities, and making friends to join forces with during the invasion. Guilds will be seeking new members, so be on the lookout for one that's right for you. In addition to the perks of guild membership, you'll have allies on your side during this tumultuous time. Here's what I find quite interesting. They're talking about the guild thing a lot. They haven't really explained why guilds are going to be a big part of this adventure. I think ArenaNet just value the fact that free-to-play people should be looking to get into guilds. Because if they don't get into guilds, they get into what I've been talking about a lot lately, which is... The fact that Guild Wars 2 doesn't really need you to socialize with anyone. Our community's been pretty good at standing around those new areas and trying to help each other out. There's been a lot of posts on Reddit and even on the official forums trying to lend those free-to-play characters a hand. So we're kind of offering people that olive branch, but there's no reason to absolutely have to party with one another. And for that reason, I think a lot of people get to level 18 in Guild Wars 2. They don't find that Guild. They don't find that community and end up quitting. I think this event is unlikely to genuinely require you to have a Guild. But they're using it as a uh, chance to give the guild system a platform and try and get people into them for when the expansion does drop and guilds may have a bit more of a place because of raids and stuff, which we'll be talking about fairly soon. So what else is there to say about this post? Not too much. I do want to point out the Mordrum Blooms. Now, there was data mining on these. You can even put the chat code in right now. What could the Dermid Priory be offering for these? I think this is an early example of ArenaNet bringing back Living World Season 1 rewards. More data mining revealed these items. The Memories of Scarlet Box, which contains components for the crafting of Spinal Blades and items from Scarlet's Assault. The Arid Dusty Satchels, containing components for the crafting of Mordry and items from the Maguma Wastes. A case of sand was uh, data mined. A large case containing piles of silky sand gathered from the Maguma waste and lastly the mysterious key pouch which we did talk about on the channel already which contains a choice of mysterious blue key green key or pink key the blue green and pink key were from the tower of nightmares arc which also took place in k6 hills and you would collect these three key pieces put them together and you get to open this chest at the top of the tower when lion's arch was rebuilt if you go to the script cave where the once a long time ago pirates used to inhabit that cave the same cave where you get the hall of monuments portal stone there is the tri key chest waiting there so i think this this could be something we do with these blooms is an opportunity for us to start opening that chest again and maybe this will be some kind of a recurring weekend i'm happy to see that something is going in game it has been a long time i know we've had a lot to talk about with the expansion some of us though we're not interested in that stuff we want to play something new and this will be that something new um i absolutely do think this is a guise for testing things i'll put it that way all right next is another post and this was a kind of complimentary post to the incredibly generic raiding post that went up uh, this past weekend when the announcements were made. I find it really funny that, you know, they make a huge announcement of raids. And they put a post up to try and talk about it as well as Colin talking about it on stage. And it really said nothing to us. Like, there was one little fact. And that was it. The rest of the blog post was just PR nonsense that really didn't give us any elaboration. So there is a little more here, and even a couple of devs have been responding. Crystal Reed um, is a developer at Arena. I'm pretty sure she was in charge of some of the world boss encounters, which were one of ArenaNet's more recent-ish attempts at doing hardcore content. And this was open world large-scale hardcore content. I think, like, I think she did Triple Trouble One, maybe even Tech as well. I don't know. But anyway, she's got an account called Crystal Raid. All right, and so they're specifically talking a little bit about raids, and I'll give you guys those clarifications as they come along. But here's what the new post says. So first of all, on the topic of the 10-man party cap, there's a couple of interesting things about this. Number one, does this mean that we can now party with 10 people? If we can just roar straight up, have a 10-man party, does that mean that that's only going to be with raids, or are they just going to say, screw it, why don't we just let have people have 10-man parties everywhere in the world? Why not? Are they going to let you have 10-man parties in World vs. World? Just as, like, for the utility of it. Are they going to do that? People aren't really sure. Or is it going to be that when you go into a raid, you still have just a five-man group, and instead, they're going to rely on, like, squadding together, these parties together, and you move in, so it's still, like, two separate units? Because... The way this works depends a lot on the way boons are shared around you. And so this is uh, quite a big topic at the moment. If they are designing raids to be 10 man, you guys may be well aware that many abilities out there only affect 5 people around you. So if everyone's bunged together in one big 10 man group, right? 
How can you be sure who gets the boons from your phalanx strength? Well, one side of the coin is, oh, it's random and that's terrible and that's really stupid. And I think you'd be inclined to say that if you think of this as a completely base example like we currently have with the game where everyone's going to be stacked on one tiny point, 10 people are going to be stacked together in range of that phalanx. Or on the other hand, maybe we're imagining us to be a little bit more spread out than this. Maybe there will be a bit more of a frontline, backline thing like we see in Wild vs. Wild, for example. And maybe here, the uh, five boon sharing from phalanx strength is more just an actual bit of play, an actual mechanic. You actually have to skillfully know who you want to be around your phalanx strength warrior. So that's one side of the discussion. I believe the dev said that they're still testing what's good with what. I would like to have heard that they've nailed this down though because I think what they choose here is really important and will genuinely affect the design of the way this stuff is played out in a huge, huge, huge way. So these are bit pretty big topics. I personally like the idea of them just looking at skills a little closer and making the amount of targets a skill affects a genuine tool for incentivizing builds and what makes something strong and what makes something not strong. Phalanx strength is currently overpowered. It's not just overpowered because most warriors ever will run this incredibly powerful thing for the way the game is currently designed, but it also completely devalues might gain that is provided by other characters. And specifically when you think about more skillful might gain, not just passive accidental stuff that's coming out because you're attacking with a greatsword. So maybe you can say, you know, phallic strength's a cool idea though. Maybe we nerf this by directly addressing the number of targets it affects. Maybe this doesn't affect five targets anymore. Maybe it only affects three. And you've got 10 people in your raid. And all of a sudden, maybe another form of might generation is better. You could take three warriors to try and provide all of that might. All phalanx strength which reduces your utility you can get from elsewhere. Or maybe blood is power was buffed recently. This is a necromancer skill. A lot of people like necromancer as the example because they've never had a strong place in PvE. Blood is power currently affects five targets and puts out eight might to everyone around you when you activate. Or is it ten might? Why don't they, they buff blood is power by contrast to affect 10 targets around you? Oh look, Necromancer suddenly has a pretty good place for might generation in plays because it's getting all 10 members of your raid while some of these other more traditional things are not. You know, like that is good design and that can be used to incentivize weak stuff and make Necromancer might generation feel different and be functionally different to, you know, blasting and fire fields. So, um, so I'd like to see them play into that. We'll see how the devs deal with that more. Moving on, they talked about uh, the idea of not having any gates to the raids. I think ArenaNet don't know what they're doing here because they keep saying there's, there's no gate to get in the raid, there's no achievement, it's as simple as walking in. First of all, I think that's kind of interesting story-wise. I'm, I'm afraid I have to talk about this for a second. Story-wise, that's interesting because they also told us that the raids take place after the events of the story. And so the the idea is like this first raid, the Bloodstone, this is going to be right near Verdant Brink. It seems like that way from the trailer. Geogra ge geographically, it seems to all line up. So this will be the first map. And apparently we can just go in it straight away. So does that mean that the story is so like removed? Yes, canonically takes place after Heart of Thorns and will be released after Heart of Thorns comes out. But it's so canonically removed from it, it's like not going to be a spoiler to go in there and play it early. Another note as well on the stream today, someone mentioned this. We're seeing fighting humans in a raid to do with the bloodstone and we're even seeing like human ruins and stuff there and what have they been hinting at in the silver waste and stuff the closest area we can get to the white mantle yeah i think we're probably going to get some white mantle activity here guys that that thrills me in one way it thrills me in the other way it tells me that there's probably not going to be any white mantle stuff in the actual story which saddens me but fine so anyway that's story side stuff but the idea that raids are just free to go in doesn't work when this very same post is telling us masteries are tied to raids and if you go into a raid without the specific raid masteries that you need it's going to destroy you they say that in this post now i actually like that design they talked a lot about how masteries are how they envision character progression beyond level 80 without having to increase the level cap and i do believe genuinely that that carrot on a stick style gameplay is something a lot of people are looking for when they look at Guild of Two. I do believe that it has a place, and I want to see that be exciting, and I want to feel like I'm continuing to grow in power in various ways through new masteries. And so I really like the idea that they're a big requirement for raids. They specifically say in this post as well that as new raids come, read raids not necessarily wings, but entirely new raids as they come, there will be more masteries associated with those raids and streaming updates to the game. That's great. It alleviates my worries about masteries being too quick to complete. 
great. They kind of talk about how, you know, in two weeks or so, they'll release the first wing. This gives you a chance to max these, the correct ma uh, masteries first. So masteries, you know, we can be finished within just two weeks or so, in theory, if we play hardcore enough. And then, oh, it's a, no a non-mechanic. But it doesn't really become a non-mechanic, because then in the future, they'll add more masteries, and we continue to experience that growth. And that's cool. I like that idea. If that's what they want to do, roll with that and tell people that that's what you want to do. Don't try and advertise raids as, oh no, these are really easy things to get and anyone can do it anytime. Yes, you can go in at any time in theory and try it in theory. But if you have no chance of completing it, it's not really something you should say. You know, in theory, I can try what running around in ore at level 2, in theory. Does that mean it's a meaningful part of the game that is something that people will actually intend to do? No, it doesn't. And so, you know, I, I think they, they're stepping on both sides of a line right now. And I don't know whether it's because of marketing or because they genuinely don't know how they want to tackle the issue. But um, I'm hoping it's just marketing because if they don't know how they want to tackle the issue, it's going to end up like a half measure and it, I don't think it could be as fun as it could be. Maybe you guys have a further, uh, some further comments on that though. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm being a little bit too harsh about it. Moving on, uh, they talk a little bit about boss mechanics and the way they envision boss mechanics to work. They, they give us three specific examples. For those of you totally new to this whole world, um, I will explain just a little bit of what they mean. So, number one, they say boss mechanics. Bosses will call for backup. Very bog standard thing. Can be a lot of fun. This is the idea of you have your boss, and the boss will do various things that can uh, pull ads into the fight. Other mobs, which then you're going uh, to gonna have to then focus on them instead of the boss to keep yourself alive. And then maybe you can do certain things in the encounter to stop the boss from summoning more ads. Maybe that's through interrupts. Maybe that's through certain positioning in different areas. That's a great mechanic. They talk about phases, boss phases. We see this a little bit in Guild Wars 2 already. Triple Trouble Worm's a great example. You have the Triple Trouble Worm fight. You've got three individual bosses. You have to kill them all at the exact same time across different corners of the map. When they all die at the exact same time, uh, you go into a new phase. And then suddenly you're fighting an entirely different boss, basically, which requires you to have different stuff. Phasing can be incredibly fun. If you think about really difficult stuff and nobody's managed to kill a boss or something... One of the most thrilling things about the Triple Trouble Worm when I was fighting for it, when we were going for the North America World first kill on it, was the thought that there was a hidden phase, a second phase, and that thrill of seeing the second phase and then getting your face smashed in by it and be like, oh my god, we thought we'd done it and we didn't, is it, really exciting. It also encourages some pretty interesting gameplay where, for example, maybe you've got to go all in to kill a boss to get push it to a phase, but then all the floor around you is going to become lava or something, and if people aren't prepared, if you're not in position for when that phase goes through, if you, you're not looking to the future, then you can get owned, and that, you know, managing phase traversals... Uh, is something we see used very successfully in other difficult games. And then they talk about enraging as well. Enraging was interesting. They made it sound like all the bosses will enrage, actually. Maybe that's an over-exaggeration. But the idea here is that if you don't kill something quick enough, if you're spending too long on the boss, it will enrage. And this could be presumably some kind of failure cause or something that really sets you back. You know, it'll do tons of damage to you, loads and loads. Maybe completely wipe you or leave you in a devastatingly bad spot. So there's that focus on clearing stuff quickly. I'm a little concerned about a, a genuine, harsh focus constantly on clearing quickly because that does mean we may not see too much change in the meta because the meta is currently tuned 100% for clearing insanely fast and nothing else because the faster you clear the easier the game gets don't let anyone tell you that the game is harder when you're killing a boss in five seconds as opposed to 20 seconds the boss in five seconds only has the ability to use a couple of things while the 20 second one can actually engage in a lot of other ways that is one of the reasons why you see dungeons are the way they are right now anyway all right so moving on they uh, gave us some other genericish comments just towards the end of the article here uh, first they said that raids they kind of think of as a challenge and they even liken them to sort of like a puzzle we saw with aetherpath probably the most engaging a uh, five-man content dungeon that they ever dropped in the game the path that there was a good mix of decent mechanics um, actual combat based mechanics as well as um, like puzzle based position based environs as you're traveling through like the electric floor room and like the uh, Room where you have to drag some tar bosses through uh, like a maze of fire while keeping uh, Sorry some oozes through a maze of fire while keeping tar away from them Which mixes you know uh, kind of a, a puzzle room with combat and they're kind of really honing in on that with raids I think that's pretty interesting. They said that they kind of envision players will have two roles Well, you'll have a role on two levels number one You'll have a role based on the build you're running so maybe you're like a DPS -y build or specifically they also say this they say some encounters are going to push you to try different weapons that you rarely use this is what we want to hear 
Some are going to challenge you to select traits you haven't considered equipping before, and some may even require a member of your group to dust off that toughness gear to bulk up and tank some heavy hits to provide the condition build players in the back. This is just a tiny sample of the build roles we want to push as a core part of Guild Wars 2's dynamic system. So, this doesn't actually tell us much, because they haven't told us how they hope to actually make this a reality. To make toughness gear a reality, they have to understand a few things. They have to understand how strong their active defenses are, are right now, and they have to understand how to bypass that. I'm a big fan of like fast attacking enemies, enemies that cannot be blocked, enemies even that do strikes through evades, for example, to force people to move around a little bit more. They have to actually understand that stuff, and those are the examples I want to hear. However, even though they don't give us examples, and I still have very little confidence that they can actually pull this off, it's nice to hear what their aims are. I have always wanted to see more variety in the gear sets. I think it's healthy for the game because it keeps people playing longer as they work for new sets and because it helps builds feel more distinct. And it's an interesting topic. You know, there's a video out there of a player killing Lupicus with one finger in no armor, I think it is, right? Like, this is how strong the active defenses are. There needs to be a core change to that before we actually need to run toughness stuff. You can look at the high scale fractals as another example. When fractals got so bad that all enemies were like one-shotting us constantly, that didn't actually cause people to run toughness gear. It meant people relied more on those active defenses like blinds and stuff because the toughness didn't matter. The toughness wasn't worthwhile enough as a stat to save you when they were hitting so hard. All it did was meant you killed the enemy slower so more damage came in so you couldn't do it. And thus people stayed zerk. These are the things that they need to be talking about. Also, on that topic, it was apparently revealed that internally testing the raids, they tend to raid with a necromancer. And, you know, that's kind of their answer. That, oh, look, it's, it's true, guys. It's true. We'll see. The other role that they kind of see people isn't just the build you're running, but it's what they're calling play roles. And this is like specific raid-based stuff that we'll be changing. So, you know, at some point, you, you it might be your job to be the guy that glides off of a platform, catches an updraft, and like goes to the side of the room and presses a button that allows your friend to go through another room and start DPS in the boss again or something. Like this kind of stuff, specific raid-based stuff. And even this interacts with combat too. So, for example, you might want to be kiting specific enemies away from specific areas because they explode and do tons of damage. They did a joke about the repair anvil. They said, we'll give you a repair anvil because you're going to get your face smashed in a lot. And it's a weird joke because I was talking yesterday. I do think it's really important that if people fail and fail and fail and fail, like eventually we get kicked out or something, but maybe not. Maybe we're just going to uh, only want to raid with people who have a full set of toughness gear and a full set of zerk gear and a full set of condi gear and a full set of this, 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 and this. And if you don't have all of these gear types because we're going to be swapping a billion times while we're in the dungeon, then you're going to get kicked. Last but not least, they did talk a little bit about the rewards. They said that it's going to be weekly gated. This is very traditional MMOE. Uh, I have no problem with this whatsoever. I'm very much likening this to, you know, if you're going to be doing this with your guild, it'll be like you do your weekly guild missions, and then you do your weekly raid with some with some members of your guild. And there you go. So it'll be like a weekly reward. I wonder actually how they'll integrate this with guilds. That would be nice if there was some word on that. Uh, they talked about the rewards we get specifically being minis, weapon skins, titles. Titles is interesting to me. One notion we do see in other games is the idea of PvE competition. And we see this a little bit in Guild Wars 2 now with like the leaderboards on adventures. So we're kind of competing against one another for times and stuff. So not like directly fighting each other, but you know, there's like that, that casual competition. And one thing that absolutely uh, ties into this too is the idea of world firsts. Are we going to get titles for the world first raid beaters? That's always something a lot of people like to fight for. I don't see too many errors with ArenaNet adding that to the game. And some people will say it's not worth it because it only caters to a tiny percentage of the population. Another little bit on this discussion is it, it's actually more than just the people who earn it. That title doesn't just impact the guy that gets the title. That title then is so prestigious and rare and exciting that that guy wears it for the rest of his time playing Guild Wars 2 and every single person he ever meets in the game sees that title and thinks, wow, that's pretty cool. Hey, maybe I want one of those one day. And it ripples on. Just because you don't own the title, just because you never beat it the hardcore difficult exclusive raid, just because you specifically didn't do it, it doesn't mean it hasn't affected you. It doesn't mean you haven't wanted to see it. It doesn't mean you haven't been more of a part of a community, sought to improve your skills and join a guild and be a part of that side of the community or tune into the Twitch streams of people doing that kind of stuff. I do believe that even if you target and only a few people can complete it, it still has rippling effects, positive rippling effects through everyone. All right, and lastly, another really cool little thing. This, I guess, was maybe inspired a bit by Wildstar. Guild Hall decorations will also be rewards um, as loot from raids and key this in with the fact that we're getting more wings and raids and stuff as time goes on. That's a big way that we'll be getting Guild Hall decorations in the game streaming live that are not through exclusively the gem store. Think about that.
And then Legendary Arm was mentioned. They didn't tell us anything new. It will be cosmetic. It will let you swap your stats. It will be of ascended quality. We don't know anything more just yet. There'll be a specific post later. Anyway, guys, there you go. That's the post for today. Thank you so much for listening. I feel like after editing this, I sounded a little bit salty about these big topics. I'm not really. It's just they're very nuanced, you know, and I feel like many of the things we can dive into here, you're, you're really going to fall on one side quite strictly or the other. It's mostly interesting to me. I'm very excited about the future of the content. Though, yes, I have a skeptical side too. Uh, thanks for listening anyway, guys, for getting to the end. And I guess I'll see you tomorrow.